Friends, hear the word of God from Isaiah on this third Sunday of Advent. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, God's glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, and they come to you. And your sons and daughters shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried in their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. The word of God. Thanks be to God. And now let's arise and sing.
siblings in Christ, behold, for God is doing a new thing. Let us open our hearts to watch for awe in the ordinary, for peace in our distress, hope in our despair, for joy in our lives, and for love to lead the way. And waiting, finding strength, sacred. Prepare the way for God's presence in the world. Let it be. Let us. Please be seated. Welcome to First Church. Wherever you are, you are loved and your presence is cherished here, just as you are. I'm Ann McCann. I was born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana, went to college in Massachusetts, joined the Peace Corps, and lived and worked in South Korea for two years, where I met my husband, David, who's here today. Um, after uh, living in various interesting places, we moved to Watertown from Ithaca, New York, 25 years ago. One summer Sunday morning, I came to First Church um, in 1998, and we've been here ever since. I've served on various committees and as a deacon, most recently working with a group on reparations and what, how, what role they might play in healing us and the broader community. It has been a full and wonderful journey. So welcome again. Um, we are so glad that you are with us on this third Sunday in Advent. Our guiding words and theme for this season are, Behold, opening to wonder. Today and throughout Advent, Let's take time to pause amid the busyness, to look up and to look in, and to behold God's presence in our world. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have some sad and glad news to add to what Anne has just shared. Hey, Lee. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I have some sad and glad news to add to what Anne has just shared with us. First, the sad news. On Thursday morning, our beloved Peter Sykes woke up and he had COVID. So he is not here with us this morning. That means that our Magnificat that he and the choir were preparing, we're going to need to hold off on that. However, I got an email from Peter this morning saying that this morning for the first time since Thursday morning he is feeling more like himself so that is good news he's feeling better and glad news we have to welcome this morning Yukyung Kim our longtime friend and organist guest organist who is with the choir today who is here in full force and they will offer they will offer wonderful sounds of Advent and we'll get to sing and Peter will be joining online. And speaking of glad news, you may have noticed someone sitting to my right <laughs> here. <laughs> Obviously he needs no introduction for most of us, but it is such a joy to welcome back Carlisle Stewart our community minister for racial justice. Carlisle, as he'll share with you later, he's preaching today, huge gift. Uh, Carlisle has been spending time in Montana over this last year, uh, working in sustainable agriculture, working and living on a ranch, um, and yet he has also kept a connection with this 
Church, um, thanks be to God. He's been leading small groups online, and we are so, so grateful for this ongoing relationship. But it has been a long time since we have had the chance to see Carlisle in person. He's preached several times online, but today we get to welcome him back here in person, and it is such a joy. We invite you to stay after church to greet him. Um, Carlisle, we couldn't be more thrilled that you're here today to break open the word with us. Glad news indeed. Now, together, we turn to our Advent wreath to center our minds and, and hearts in the presence of God. Please join us in response to the lighting of the third Advent calendar. God, we light the third Advent candle. May joy sustain us in this time and guide us for a work for compassion and justice. It's time to quiet our hearts, to be still, and to be honest with ourselves. Recalling moments this past week we have not attempted, attended to. You, we have not attended to your presence in our lives and in the life of the world. Maybe our eyes strive for relentless perfection, our minds reverted to thoughts of scarcity, our ears closed with defensiveness, our mouths reacted with harsh words. Let the Spirit hold you now in this moment of wonder and grace as we open our hearts to God. Let us pray for justice, pardon, and peace. God, when we turn away from gifts of your presence every day, help us open our hearts to wonder. We ignore the sacred in each other's humanity. Forgive us when we grow weary and turn to distractions guide us. Help us to attend to creating a world rooted in your justice and joy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, hear this good news. Wherever and however we strayed, we can always return to God and choose to start again. Now, please rise and share the wonder of God's love with one another, with a sign of peace. Feel free to greet each other with a hug or a handshake, 
Uh, if you prefer to maintain social distance, please put your hands together or fold your arms like this. Peace be with you, First Church. Please join me in our prayer for understanding. Spirit of the living God, draw us back to these ancient words. We pray that these words read aloud and those in all of our hearts ground us with faith Fill us with hope. Guide us with love. And sustain us with your peace. Amen. Our reading from, for this morning uh, comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 56. It is the Magnificat, or Mary's song of praise, this reading comes from the Inclusive Bible. Mary said, My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with favor upon your lowly servant, and from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. 
Your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. You have disposed the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you have sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. Here ends our reading. May it be blessed to our understanding. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, on this day that you have anointed, that you have blessed, we give you thanks for this community, for the Spirit of God that moves us, inspires us, and reminds us of hope, of joy, of peace and love to be found in Jesus during this season. And God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So I should probably start by saying good morning, First Church. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I've stood in this pulpit, but I gotta say it feels really good to be back here um, in a community 
people I know and love and care for and know and love and care for me. Uh, so it feels real good to be here. So thank you for inviting me back and for having me here on this day. This church and this community played such an important role in my own spiritual growth and pastoral development. So I'm very grateful to be here. Some of you may have been wondering what I've been up to for the past year. <laughs> uh, that's a long story, but you know, I think Dan summed it up in a, in a nutshell. I've been living on the Northern Plains in central Montana for the past year or so, doing a lot of regenerative agricultural work, uh, working on conservation, soil health, uh, working on a pretty large livestock operation out there. So uh, that's been a dream in one way, but also really tough, really difficult at times. Um, and it's definitely a different person standing here in this pulpit than last time I was here. So I give glory to God and thanks to God for that opportunity. And I'd be happy to talk with any of you more about it, you know, after service. When I accepted this invitation to preach, I was a bit nervous because the work that I was doing, to be honest, had me feeling really far from God in the church. But then I remembered I was communing with God every day, albeit in different ways. I wasn't sitting in a divinity school classroom reading theology books. I think I might have read one chapter in one book this entire year. <laughs> but that's okay, you know, because God still works in us and through us in different ways. But one thing this year has brought up for me is the theme of community. And Advent is my favorite liturgical season because we're looking forward to the birth of Jesus. It's a time where we celebrate love, hope, peace, and joy, all which are represented in his birth. It's a season when we're called to give our praise and thanks to God and to let God know how grateful we are for what and who we have. And it's funny because I think I preached on this exact text a couple years ago around this same exact time of year. And I was struggling when I was you know, writing it. And at one point I went back in my computer through my old documents. I'm like, let me see if I can pull up that old sermon. But I said, you know what? No, I'm just going to let God move me in a different way and, and just preach from the heart, right? So when I look at the Magnificat and I read Mary's song of praise, at first I thought she was only giving thanks to God for her pregnancy, for the coming birth of the Son of Man, the salvation of the world. I figured she was so overwhelmed with joy by the irony of her situation that she couldn't help but say thank you. Because at that time, many people of the Judaic faith expected the Messiah to be born into royalty, right? Maybe just some rich or wealthy family. Not to her, a poor, relatively unknown young woman from Nazareth. For centuries dating all the way back to the book of Genesis, the scriptures pointed to a savior who would deliver the world from spiritual bondage and establish God's kingdom on earth. So you can imagine that when Mary learned of her pregnancy, she was probably skeptical. Surely this couldn't be the savior the prophets spoke of. And what she didn't yet know was that baby Jesus would be born in a barn in the middle of the night placed in a feeding trough surrounded by a bunch of weird old shepherds who probably smelled pretty bad and didn't have great social skills. <laughs> and I can say that because I've been one of them for the past year. <laughs> so I say that with all due respect, right? So <laughs> I think this entire story, the whole situation was unexpected. So in our text for today, on the surface, the main message of the Magnificat is that Mary is giving thanks to God for the miracle that is about to take place. But the more I think about her state of mind, the worry, the confusion she probably had, I believe she's also giving thanks to God for blessing her with a loving community, a community found in Elizabeth. Shortly before Mary's song, the angel Gabriel appears to her and, she sa and the, the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call 
his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and in his kingdom there will be no end. But behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So when Mary visits Elizabeth in the hill country of Judah, they see each other, the baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb and she's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Mary Mary sings her song of praise and then they stay together for three long months. And this is a powerful moment and when I imagine it in my mind, I see a lot of joy. I see a lot of relief shared between the two of them because they now know that they are not alone in their experience together. The pregnancies of both Elizabeth and Mary, from a practical perspective, are impossible. But look at how God has made the impossible possible with the two of them. This is a moment of affirmation that confirms that God has been in control the entire time. And not only that, but the community that they have established with each other is actually how they can see and experience the works of God and also be mutually supported in their pregnancy. You see, community, it looks different for everyone, but you know when you found it. It's not just being around people that you know or know you, but I think it's being with people who share our similar experiences, our struggles. It's being around people who love you for who you are, but will also hold you accountable people who you can share your laughters, your joys, your sorrows without fear of judgment or shame, where you can argue and not worry about being discarded. It's people you can sit and share beautiful silence with. It's people with whom you can be your authentic self and release all the subconscious fears and pressures and expectations that we carry with us every single day. And the greatest fulfillment that we can ever have is to belong and to be held within a loving community. So Mary's song of praise, her joy is partly because of Jesus, yes, but it also reflects her appreciation for Elizabeth, a close friend and family member who is sharing her experience. How wonderful it is to be loved and cared for and to feel safe among your loved ones. And I'm always thinking about this theme of community. We always talked about it in divinity school. And I imagine many of us here think about it as well. And personally, it's something that I've struggled with throughout the past year working in agriculture because it's tough work. Not only are you doing work in very isolated and remote environments, but when you're working with animals and land and dealing with weather and unforeseen circumstances, it really will test your mental resolve. And one thing I learned is that we can be living our passions, we can be living our dreams out every single day, but if we don't ever have the opportunity to do that in community, then it will always leave something to be desired. There are so many demands in our lives that take us away from our community. Technology, work, school, travel, global pandemics, I mean, think about it. Look at the way the world is organized, right? The reality is many of us spend more time craving community than actually being in it sometimes. And if we're lucky, we get a week or two off at the end of the year and we can go travel and visit family, then it's back to the usual, right? And many professionals agree that one of the most important factors that contribute to human mental health is strong social and communal ties. And without them, we suffer. The modern world has developed a lot faster than our brains have, and sometimes we need to just get back to the basics to find wellness. We see the importance of community all throughout the Bible, not only in the story of Mary and Elizabeth, but look at Jesus. He ministers to people in community. He made time for leisure in community. The community of the apostles helped him in his ministry. His entire life 
was dedicated to encouraging us to unify as one in the community of the church. So everything about Jesus' work on this earth was to teach us to prioritize community and loving others as we love ourselves. But Jesus also taught us another important thing, that the work of God should not be done alone or in isolation. Solitude is important, but that's different. And I don't think solitude was meant to be a permanent state because the scriptures teach us that where two or more are gathered, Christ is there among them. There's something sacred about groups of people coming together, especially to honor God and to do good in the world. Because it is in community where the spirit of God can flow and inspire us to make an impact on the world. It's in community where the spirit of God can flow and work through the people around us. And our text is a perfect example of that. Can you imagine if Mary or Elizabeth had to endure that by themselves? I assure you it had been a very different experience and the words of the Magnificat probably would read a lot different. I think there would have been less joy and much more worry. The words of the Magnificat display to us the power of being in loving community. And it reminds us that God was in control of the entire thing. So never should we ever fall into the trap of thinking that we can only rely on ourselves or that we can only have the most fulfilling relationship with God on our own without being a part of a loving community. Whether during times of hardship or great success, in all of those moments, we should be coming closer to one another and giving our praise to God. But sometimes, I know in times of success or hardship, it leads us to turn inwards. I know I struggle with that sometimes instead of coming closer to the people that love me. And this is why I love Advent because this is a time to do that. It's a time to really stop and think about what's important, who's important. But sometimes our culture beyond the church misses the point of Christmas and the Advent season, right? This is a time where and I'm guilty of it myself, many people focus on things. And I understand why, because we live in an economic system that's dependent upon the purchase and exchange of goods and services. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having things or giving gifts, but these companies understand human psychology and through clever marketing and advertising, they're able to convince us that the acquisition of their goods is gonna fulfill our desires and make us whole. And some of us have made possessions, our possessions, our community. And I think due to an overall breakdown in social and spiritual bonds, we may fill that void that we all have with things, with distractions. Oh, if I can just have that new car, that new job, that, that new house, that new thing, then I'll be happy. Then I'll have everything I need. And that's the last thing that I'll need. And what happens? You might be good for a couple months until something else comes around, and then you realize that you need that too. And trust me, I've been there. I'm guilty of it. I personally have this thing for shoes. <laughs> I'll spend some money on some shoes. I'm not going to lie to you. I will. <laughs> and I bought a pair of shoes a couple months ago, real nice boots. And, you know, I was like, okay, you know, my collection is it's complete. I don't need anything else. <laughs> And then uh, a friend of mine who I work with came to work one day with these brand new, like these, these tall cowboy boots that almost went up to the knees. I was like, I kind of like those. Where'd you get those from? <laughs> and that day I decided I needed another pair of shoes. And the cycle just keeps on going, right? So I think that during the season, we should be seeking out and craving community above all else. I heard a wise man say once, slow to purchase, quick to self-care. And I think that applies here as well. Slow to purchase, quick to spend time with loved ones, quick to reach out to the people that we haven't talked to in a while, quick to spend time with family and those who will support us. As Colossians 3, 2 reads, set your mind on things that are above and not simply the things that are on earth. So what if we got into the habit of setting our minds on the love of God and the love of our community? Can you all think of a time when you felt that overwhelming presence of God in community with others? Hopefully every Sunday, right? I know I felt it here. 
in the various small groups and sessions that I've been a part of at this church, there's some moments where you feel this overwhelming sense that God is present. And it's more powerful, it's more intense than you've ever felt maybe near to God in private or by yourself. It's a, it's, it's a feeling that's hard to explain, but from personal experience, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. It doesn't matter how bad things are or how great things are. It's always healing and restorative. And I think that that's what we need more of during this time. Think of Mary and Elizabeth during those three months, what they shared with one another, the hopes, the questions. What is the mother who is about to give birth to arguably one of the most important human beings to ever walk the earth, what does she think about? What are her concerns? I imagine there was a lot of laughter, a lot of joy, and I think we all need an Elizabeth in our lives. Who do you love? When is the last time you were with them and just spent quality time? Who do you consider your community? And it doesn't have to be relatives. It can be anyone. So I encourage us all to reflect and to answer those questions and to work on strengthening those relationships. But I must also say that I know that there are those here that struggle during this season because of the people we've lost. The community members that have gone on to higher realms and the pain of their absence. At some times, it's just too much to bear. And I understand that. There are those of us here who have lost most of our community due to death, separation, or just time. And I know God understands that. But we must never forget that we are loved and worthy of love, worthy of God's love, worthy of communal love. And wherever we are in our journey, we deserve that. We need that to know ourselves and to know God. So check in on each other this season. I encourage us all to do that. Extend a loving invitation to someone. Connect, grow, build your community, strengthen the ties with the ones that you already have. And I know this community in particular, this church continues to be a pillar of light, love, and hope for so many people in this community. And I feel blessed to be a part of it. So, beloved, in the spirit of Christ, in the spirit of loving community, I pray that we can receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit this season, that we can establish and strengthen the bonds in our lives, and most importantly, we can dedicate those relationships to God so that God can be at work in us, and we can be guided to do the work of Christ in the church and beyond. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone, once again, and welcome. Wherever you are on the journey of life, the journey of faith, welcome, no matter your race or class or creed or ethnicity or age or ability, welcome no matter who you love or your gender expression or gender or sexual orientation. We are so glad that you all are with us this morning. You help us build a sense of community, and your presence enriches our community here. We are glad you are here. Carlisle, thank you. Thank you once again for breaking open the word in that beautiful way, for um, inviting us to consider uh, the theme of community, for offering a fresh take on the Magnificat, and um, Thank you for being who you are and for being with us. Carlisle has been able to stay with us for an extended time through a gift of a grant from the Boston University School of Theology uh, Creative Callings Program, and that is continuing for a little bit longer. And so we hope to have another cycle of work um, with Carlisle as we continue to figure out what our calling is in terms of um, our racial justice work, and Carlisle is also 
obviously on a path to figure out what his calling is. I will never think about the shepherds in the same way, by the way. Amen. <laughs> I'm always going to think about Carlisle when I think about the shepherds now. Um, but uh, we are so grateful to have this time with you today. And, um, and stay tuned for um, uh, next steps uh, with Carlisle in the new year. Friends, after church today, we are uh, excited to offer our uh, first in-person alternative Christmas fair in uh, two years now it's been. So thanks to Molly Baker, thanks to Jazz Buchanan for setting that up. We have, I think, eight or ten nonprofits that are going to benefit from um, our coming through and, um, and uh, hopefully uh, sharing our gifts with them. These are gifts that keep on giving. Uh, so please join us for that. Um, looking ahead, in case you're doing some scheduling, our Christmas Eve service, 6 o'clock here in person. Again, the first time in just about three years. Um, and um, our Christmas Day service at 11 on a Sunday morning this year. And next Sunday, we will have our fabulous Unpageant. And uh, Jazz Buchanan and Sarah Hagenbotham have been working very hard on that. Um, and this will also be a Sunday for sad news and glad news. Um, uh, sad news that it will be our last Sunday uh, with um, our fabulous community, our fabulous pastoral associate, Jazz Buchanan, um, before she uh, moves on into her next chapter of her life with her family, and uh, yet um, we celebrate her next steps in her ministry. Uh, there will be a farewell reception for Jazz, uh, a cookie swap, a cake, a chance to celebrate Jazz's amazing uh, ministerial gifts with us, so please plan to come to the unpageant, uh, get filled up with joy, and share in uh, the joy and celebration of Jazz's wonderful ministry with us after church next week. And with that, I now invite Jazz to offer our prayer on this Magnificat Sunday. God be with you. Let us pray. God, this morning, we open our hearts to receive the fullness of your presence. Lifting all that we are and all that we have to you. Help us to pause now, to wonder and to behold. Yes, God, we know we can look and behold your grace and love all around us. And today, Mary reminds us that we can behold your presence within us. For your decision to enflesh humanity and divinity began with and within Mary and a human just like us. A decision that draws our attention to the sacredness inherent in our own DNA and this very body we all move and breathe in. In the coming weeks, God, help us to not move too quickly into the mystery of Christmas. Help us to be in this very moment, feeling the good news of your presence growing within each of us. God, there's a lot to hold in our lives. It can sometimes be really hard to embrace joy after another year of gun violence, police brutality, war, famine, natural disasters caused by climate crisis. We could go on, God but you already know. In our most vulnerable moments, may we hear Mary, a woman who lived on the margins, who experienced and witnessed some of humanity's greatest fears and uncertainties, a woman whose strength gives us courage even now. May we hear her voice. May we hear her singing now, O oh God singing a song to a melody we all recognize, a song we can feel swaddling us with warmth and hope, a song that calls us home, a song that longs for us to be who you, God, made us to be. 
We hear her song and we sing with her this morning to proclaim your greatness. For you, Almighty, have indeed done great things. You have raised the lowly to high places and have filled the hungry. We praise you, O God. God, may Mary's song this morning and may our singing reach beyond these walls, beyond the technology that connects us as one church community. May the words and the melody find its way to every heart this day, to every child who feel, fearfully participates in shooting drills, every teacher who comforts them, every person struggling to make enough money to feed and clothe themselves and their loved ones, every tree, every garden struggling to fruit, to bear fruit amid harsh weather and climate change, every refugee. God, may Mary's words reach every heart in need of healing. May her tune ring peace and hope in every ear. Prepare us now, God, for the revolutionary story of Christmas that is to come. May we feel the story growing in us, a story that will flip this world upside down, a story that is ancient and that is new, a story that will birth new life, new life that is present in her very bones, a new life that plants seeds of your grace in the core of our souls a new life we can all sing and rejoice to as our hearts join together as one with Mary. God, we pray for all this as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, we continue our Advent season of attention and wonder. Who we are, what we have, and what we shall become are gifts from God. Our weekly offering, as well as pledges for the new year, will now be given and gratefully received.
of hope and love, we give you thanks for these gifts that sustain and empower your ministry and mission in our community. Guide us as we seek to plant your seeds of Advent, hope in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved community of First Church, we thank you all for joining us this morning and we pray that you go forward during this Advent season with a heart of love, of grace, of peace, of hope, and remembering the gift and the blessing of community. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>